Welcome back to Deep Learning. So today we want to look at a couple of initialization techniques that will come in really handy throughout your work with deep learning networks. Experience tells us that the stuff that works best is really simple. So you may wonder why does initialization matter if you have convex functions? Actually, it doesn't matter at all because you follow the negative gradient direction and you will always find the global minimum. So no problems for convex optimization. However, many of the problems that we are dealing with are non-convex. A non-convex function may have different local minima. If I start at this point, you can see that I achieve one local minimum by the optimization. But if I were to start at this point, you can see that I wouldn't end up with a very different local minimum. So for non-convex problems, initialization is actually a big deal. Neural networks with non-linearities are in general non-convex. So what can be done? Well, of course, you have to work with some initialization. For the biases, you can start quite easily initialize them to zero. This is very typical. But keep in mind that if you're working with a rectified linear unit, you may want to start with a small positive constant. This is better because of the dying relu issue. For the weights, you need to be random to break the symmetry. We already had this problem. In dropout, we saw that we need additional regularization in order to break the symmetry. Also, it would be especially bad to initialize them with zeros because then the gradient is zero. So this is something that you don't want to do. Similar to the learning rate, the variance influences the stability of the learning process. Small uniform Gaussian values work. Now you may wonder how we can calibrate those variances. Let's suppose we have a single linear neuron with weights w and input x. Remember, the capital letters here mark them as random variables. Then you can see that the output is w times x. So this is a linear combination of the respective inputs plus some bias. Now we are interested in the variance of y hat. If we assume that w and x are independent, then the variance of every product can actually be computed as the expected value of x to the power of 2 times the variance of w plus the expected value of w to the power of 2 times the variance of x. And then you add the variances of the two random variables. Now, if we require x and w to have zero mean, this would simplify the whole issue. The means would be zero, so the expected values cancel out and our variance would simply be the multiplication of the two variants. Now we assume that x and w are independent and identically distributed. In this special case, we can then see that essentially n here is scaling our variances. So it's actually dependent on the number of inputs that you have towards your layer. This is a scaling of the variance with your w. So you can see that the weights are very important. Effectively, the more weights you have, the more it scales the variance. As a result, we can then work with Xavier initialization. So we calibrate the variances for the forward pass. We initialize with a zero mean Gaussian and we simply set the standard deviation to one over fan in, where fan in is the input dimension of the weights. So we simply scale the variance to be one over the number of input dimensions. In the backward pass, however, we would need the same effect backward. So we would have to scale the standard deviation with one over fan out, where fan out is the output dimension of the weights. So you just average those two and compute a new standard deviation. This initialization is called after the first author of 21. Well, what else can be done? There's He initialization, which then also identifies the assumption of linear neurons as a problem. So in 12, they showed that for ReLUs, it's better to actually use the square root of 2 over fan in as the standard deviation. 
So this is a very typical choice for initializing the weights randomly. Then there are other initial choices that you typically do. L2 regularization, you use dropout with a probability of 0.5 for fully connected layers, and you use them selectively in convolutional neural networks. So you do mean subtraction, batch normalization, and he initialization. So this is the very typical setup. So which other tricks do we have left? One important technique is transfer learning. So that is transfer learning, and it has been done in principle for many decades. Now transfer learning is typically used in all situations where you have little data. One example is medical data. There you typically have very little data. So the idea is to reuse models, for example, trained on ImageNet. Then you can reuse things that have been trained on a different task for the same data. You can also use different data for the same task, or you could even do different data on different tasks. So now the question is, what should we transfer? Well, the convolutional layers extract features and the expectation now is that less task-specific features are in earlier layers. We have seen that in a couple of papers. We can also see that in our videos on visualization. So typically those have more basic information and are likely contain information that is worth transferring. We cut the network at some depth in the feature extraction part. For those extracted parts, we can fix the learning rate to zero. So if we set it to zero, they won't change. As an alternative, you can also start fine tuning them. One example here is skin cancer classification. They use a deep convolutional neural network based on Inception v3. They have a state of the art architecture that was pre-trained on ImageNet. Then they fine tune it on skin cancer data. So they essentially take the network and what you have to replace is essentially the right hand part. The training of the classes is something that you won't find on ImageNet. So there you have to replace the entire network because you want to predict very different classes. Then you can use a couple of fully connected layers in order to map your learned feature representations to a different space. Then you can do a classification from there. There's also transfer between modalities. This was also found to be beneficial. Now you can transfer from color to x-ray and here it's actually sufficient to simply copy the input image three times. Then you don't need that much fine tuning. So this works pretty well. One alternative is that you use feature representations of other networks as a loss function. This then leads to perceptual loss. We will talk about perceptual loss in a different video. In any case, transfer learning is typically a very good idea. There are many applications and many papers where they have been using transfer learning. A long time ago, in the 80s, they didn't say transfer learning, but they said adaptation. In particular, in speech processing, they have speaker and noise adaptation and so on. But nowadays, you say transfer learning. It's essentially the same concept. Next time in deep learning, we will talk about the remaining tricks of the trade and regularization. So I hope you enjoyed this video and I'm very much looking forward to seeing you in the next one. Thank you and goodbye.